Brethren in Christ, Laudato Jesus Christus in Secula. This is Timothy Flanders with the meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. We're coming to you today with part five of our series, Jews, Judaism, and Israel, History of a People. This part five is going to be fully public. This is a patron-only series, but this part is going to rehash some of the basic material that you may have seen on this channel. If you're familiar with our series on the Holy Bible, or if you've read my book on it, uh, this material will be familiar to you. This is going to provide an introduction to the dynamic of Jesus and the Talmud. This is the inner dynamic that is present in the Holy Gospels that is what largely defines the interplay and the tension between our Lord Jesus Christ and the Jews, especially in the Gospel of St. John, but in the other Gospels as well, and really defines the establishing of Christianity and the modern form of Judaism, that is so-called rabbinic Judaism, and really what continues to define that tension to this day, Jesus and the Talmud. And so this introductory lecture will provide listeners and viewers with the basics of this question, because it really needs to be unpacked in detail before we even get to the Talmud itself. The concepts about oral tradition and oral culture that we've discussed in this channel are contained in this lecture in an introductory way, which starts at the book of Genesis and goes all the way through the Gospels talking about the context of the Holy Scriptures in oral tradition, because the Talmud itself is an oral tradition. It is an oral tradition that it pre-existed our Lord for centuries. And in fact, we can really, there's a quotation in this lecture that we have from the great Cardinal Franzelin, in which he actually discusses, he, he, he talks about the Talmud actually without mentioning the, ter the term Talmud, but he does talk about uh, this Talmudic text. So the Talmud is the oral tradition of Truly, specifically the Pharisees, the Mishnah itself. Mishnah itself is the oral tradition of the Pharisees, which is written down by uh, Rabbi Hanasi later on, uh, a few centuries after our Lord, and then is commented upon creating the Talmud in the 400s through 600s. And this written document is of the oral tradition of the Pharisees. So the oral tradition of the Pharisees is the tension that that uh, informs the Gospels. So this is what is be between the lines, behind the the subtext. This is the subtext of the Gospels. It's Jesus versus the Talmud, and it is more complex than you may realize. It may it is actually more complex because it is the formation. What uh, our Lord does in the Gospels is what the church does to every culture after this. That is, Jesus takes what has been passed down and cleanses it of demonic content. He baptizes a culture. And Jesus is baptizing the Jews in the Gospels in the same way that he will baptize every other culture. Because every, every culture has something that's been passed down from Adam that is actually good. And that is baptized, cleansed of a demonic content, and raised to a people of God. And yet, the Jews actually have something much more than what was passed down from Adam. They have the Mosaic Law. And they also have the Oral Law passed down from Moses. <clears throat> and so the Talmud is not actually uh, it is a complex thing so it requires a bit of detail <clears throat> so in this introductory lecture this is being provided for free 
This interaction will provide an introduction to oral culture and the context of the Holy Scriptures. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then next week, So next week, we will do a much more detailed discussion of the Talmud as it, is, as it arises in the Holy Scriptures themselves, and a discussion of how the Talmud is formed, because the Talmud has been called the Constitution of Rabbinic Judaism. We've, so we've talked in our series, parts one through four, about the history of Jews and Judaism in Israel, up to this point, until this, this confrontation, especially, that happens between our Lord, the Messiah, and the Jews, and Israel. And the formation of the Talmud is central for the rest of the story as it goes through the year 400, 600. So we'll talk about the next, next after uh, next week, we'll talk about, uh, on the patron-only series, we'll talk about Jesus and the Talmud, Within the Gospels and the formation of the Talmud, go into further detail about what is the Mishnah, what is the Talmud, what are the texts, what do they say. And then that'll be part six. And then part seven, the week after that, which will be a few days before Christmas, we're actually going to be talking about Jesus in the Talmud. There is a text by Peter Schaefer called Jesus in the Talmud. We'll talk about what does the Talmud itself say about Jesus? What does it say about Mary? What does it say about the Messiah in general? And how does this form, how does this inform us as to how the Jews and specifically the Pharisees understood the Messiah? Why did they largely reject our Lord? What was their motivation? And how does the Talmud form their consciousness of accepting or rejecting Christ and the Messiah? And we might do another part, part eight. I'm not sure about the, the very same topic. So we're going to be discussing Jesus in the Talmud in part seven. So th those two parts will be for patrons. So if you'd like to access those two parts, uh, you can become a patron. Patreon.com slash Meaning of Catholic. You can also donate. If you go to meaningofcatholic.com. Click on Donate. You can send us a donation to access the series. If you'd like to support the apostolate, just share this video. This is a great introduction to a lot of the material that we've covered here before in one place, in one lecture. And so this is an introduction to the context of the Holy Scriptures, which will give us a general introduction. And then next week, we're going to talk more about Jesus and the Talmud, in specifically in the Gospel, the formation of the Talmud, the formation of Virginic Judaism, and the week after that, Jesus in the Talmud itself, what does the Talmud say? So that's the plan. That's what we'll be covering. So send me all of your questions and uh, become a patron if you'd like to access that show. So thank you very much. And here is the lecture on the introduction to the context of the Bible, which is oral tradition, which is the general context of the formation of the Talmud itself, which is merely the oral tradition of the Pharisees. Raise your hand if you're a convert from Protestantism. I got four. Everyone else is blessed to be a cradle Catholic. Well, I, I envy you because I too am a Protestant convert. I look forward to the day that I will have, be, have lived more of my life as a Catholic than a, than a Protestant. That day has not yet come. So I became Catholic uh, shortly after Pope Francis was elected. So I've only been Catholic for eight years now. Eight years, yeah, eight years. But um, I am a bachelor's degree in Greek and Latin from Grand Valley. And I did graduate work with the Catholic University of Ukraine. But then I quit that because I needed money because I was getting married. So I don't have a graduate degree. But I wrote a book called Introduction to the Holy Bible on various topics. And I, have, uh, I am the founder of Meaning of Catholic. Meaning of Catholic is an online apostolate um, whose goal is to uh, restore the rival schools of Catholicism. 
and, but that's another topic. I'm also the editor of an online journal called 1 Peter 5. So that's 1peter5.com. It's, about, it's a Catholic journal of Catholic culture and tradition. So, but I'm glad you brought that up about the word of God. Protestants kind of worship it because as Catholics, we believe that we, we read the Bible, not to, not to go down on, on Protestants or whatever, but we read the Bible and the Bible tells us what the word of God is. Because John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Logos, the word of God. We believe that the word of God is Jesus Christ, period, full stop. That's the end. The word of God in terms of the Bible is the word about the word of God. Because the true word of God is the Logos of God, who is Jesus Christ himself. So the title of this talk is taking the whole Bible as a whole out of context. Because talk about Protestants take the Bible out of context. This is an example of taking the Bible out of context. But I'm, what I'm going to try to do here is we talk about what I talk about in my book. And that is the true context of the Bible as a whole. The true context of the whole Bible is something called oral culture. Oral culture. We live in a literary culture which was born around 1500. The, the whole world before 1500 was oral culture. And oral culture still exists in certain places even today. Like bagpipe music, for example. Like bagpipe music, absolutely. Music is essential to oral culture. And so you can go to certain places today and find out what oral culture is. But by and large, oral culture is completely gone, especially in societies like ours, because we live in this literary culture. So let me first start by reading from Dei Verbum, chapter 1. You guys ever read Dei Verbum? It's the document from Vatican II on the scripture. And it it, it understands revelation as primarily the revelation of a person to us. And who's the person but God himself? God is revealing himself. That's what revelation is. And this will bring out what is oral culture because oral culture is about speaking. Let me just read some passages here from Dave Verma. This is just chapter 1, paragraph 2. In his goodness and wisdom, God chose to reveal himself and to make known to us the hidden purpose of his will by which through Christ, the word made flesh, man might in the Holy Spirit have access to the Father and come to share in the divine nature. Through this revelation, therefore, the invisible God, out of the abundance of his love, speaks to men as friends. God, who through the word creates all things and keeps them in existence, gives men an enduring witness to himself in creating realities. So, in the very beginning was the word, as, as we said. But we see in the very beginning of Genesis that God speaks. He speaks. And he's revealing himself when he speaks. And this is all oral. Nobody's writing anything down for the whole book of Genesis. Book of Genesis is a snapshot of oral culture. We'll talk about why the generations are so critical. Because we have God speaking. God just speaks something into creation. Then he speaks to Adam. All of this is an oral culture. No one's writing anything down yet. In an oral culture, as it exists up to about 1500, is that what we believe today, historians have falsely posited, especially since the 19th century, they've posited that people who are illiterate and can't read are actually dumb. That's their idea. Because they, they, under, they live in this literate culture, and they're like, well, if you can't read, you're dumb. You're, like, you're less intelligent. But that's not true. That, that's like saying that person's like an, a, a subhuman who evolved now that we can read. That's not true. When you can't read, you actually can remember things better. Yeah, in fact, musical, like, for example, the Gregorian chant of the church was not really written down until uh, 9th, 10th, 11th century. But people were remembering the music and passing it down orally. Yeah. Let me read a few uh, quotations here that I have from scholars in my book. Um, here's a, a quote from David Rubin from The Cognitive Psychology of Epic Ballads and Counting Out Rhymes from Oxford University Press. He says this, this is about oral culture. 
Songs, stories, and poems are kept safe in stable form for centuries without the use of writing, whereas the literate observer has trouble remembering what happened yesterday without notes. And especially now we have smartphones, so the smartphones do all the thinking for us. We, we, can't, we don't even need to think. So when you think about, you ever read Homer, Homer's Odyssey, for example? That was recited from memory. That's a long, epic poem. But people did that, and they can still do that today. People can still, there's anthropologists. If you're an anthropologist, you have to learn the skill of going out into the field and talking with the natives and doing this and doing that. And then you come home at night, and then you transcribe every single thing that was said. But that's something that human beings could do naturally in an oral culture. Everybody remembers what is said. Here, here's another quote from, uh, this is from John Miles Foley, Signs of Orality, from Brill, 1999. We are becoming ever more aware of how indebted many of our cherished literary works are to preliterate, i.e. oral tradition, media. The Judeo-Christian Bible reveals its oral traditional roots. Medieval European manuscripts are penned by performing scribes. Geometric vases from archaic Greece mirror Homer's oral style. Indeed, if these final decades of the millennium have taught us anything, it must be that oral tradition never was the other we excused it of being. It never was the primitive preliminary technology of communication we thought it to be. Rather, if the whole truth is told, oral tradition stands out as the single most dominant communicative technology of our species, as both a historical fact and, in many areas, still a contemporary reality. So this is the context of the Bible that we need to understand, which I'm going to parse out, is oral culture. Now, oral culture breaks down into four elements. This is based on the work of Christopher Dawson, who's, the, in my opinion, the greatest historian of culture. It breaks down to four elements. First, there's the cultus. The cultus is a religious rite. Every single culture, has, no demand, has a religious rite, which is the design. The cultus is to supplicate the divinity so the divinity will give you rain for your crops, etc. So, second part, which is tradition. Now, cultus is technically a part of tradition, but tradition, I'm separating them for an important uh, a purpose. Tradition is everything passed down. And I mean everything. Everything passed down from the way you dance, the way you dress, the way you talk, your morality, your religious beliefs, every single thing that's passed down is tradition. The, the term tradition is a verb and a noun in Greek and Latin, which means to pass down. So you, you tradition something. The next element of oral culture is elders. The elders are the office in any culture who go everybody from the parents to the priesthood to the king, everybody who's in an office of authority, their job is to pass down the tradition, explain the cultus to the next generation. That's their job. And their job, the next generation's job is to have piety. Piety is the virtue. This is the, same, this is the Thomistic understanding. We say piety like I, I'm a devoted Catholic, but that's not, that's colloquial meaning. Thomas's meaning of piety is the virtue by which we give honor and reverence to elders. That's what piety is. So the next generation has to have piety so that they can receive the tradition and the cultists from the elders. This is how every single culture works, known to man. They all got this. It's just a, a fact of life until we get to the modern period, but that's another story. So all of this is oral. It, they may or may not have writing in any culture, but this can function without, without uh, anything written. And the, the key is that the, the cultist has a bunch of rituals, and the rituals are signs of different things that exist, that happen, stories, mythologies, moralities, all sorts of things are communicated with the cultist. Um, so in the book of Genesis, we have, we understand that we, we have Dei Verbum, which talks about God revealing himself, and that's, the, that's what revelation is. It's oral. There's a certain, there's a certain uh, meta metaphysical nature of God himself in a community of persons, the divine trinity, is oral in the sense of communication of oneself. But God creates using the word, and then what does he do? He speaks to Adam. And then Adam speaks to his son, his sons Cain and Abel. 
And what does he do? The, the very first thing, this is why the genealogies are so important. The book of Genesis is a story of two different genealogies. It's the story of Genesis existing in oral culture. One, one genealogy in, in Genesis has piety. The other does not. And that's the key difference. Okay? Every other, you got, so you have Genesis, the logos, God creates man. And then you have the righteous line all the way to, this is abbreviation for Jesus Christ, if you've seen it on icons, for example. So here's the righteous line as, as the Gospels um, tell us. There's a genealogy in, in two, two of the Gospels. You know, you've read that maybe. The genealogy goes all the way back to Adam. I think that's Luke's. Pretty sure it's Luke's that does that, because one of them doesn't. But. So there's the righteous line, okay? And the righteous line has piety, because Adam passes down to first Abel and Cain, but then he has to pass it down to Seth. And then it gets, all this gets passed down, passed down, passed down, passed down, oral culture, oral culture, all the way to Jesus Christ. We'll talk about that in a second. But that, off of the righteous line, there's all these wicked lines, and they all reject piety. And they go off and do their own thing. And the first, of course, is Cain. So what does Cain do? The very first struggle in the Bible is over the cultists. Abel offers the cultists correctly. And that's because Adam taught his son to worship God and follow his commandments orally. Nothing was written down. Totally oral culture. He teaches him the cultists. He teaches them tradition. He says, worship God. And Abel does it right. Cain doesn't. Cain, he wants to make his own cultus. And he wants to, and so he kills his brother. He wants to do his own thing. And this is the origin of every false religion. Because every false religion is basically just a mixture of Adam's religion mixed up with demonic elements, basically. Because the fallen angels came in, and they came in, and they induced various cultures to basically worship them as gods. The fallen angels came in and said, I'm Jupiter, worship me. I'm, uh, you know, what are the Hindu gods? I'm not, Vishnu, I'm Vishnu, worship me. Those are just fallen angels. Those are demons mixing with the true cultists. So they're just mixing. So, they've, so all these different false religions, they still have. This is why the, when the church goes to the Native Americans, the church doesn't say reject your entire culture and become European. That's not what the church does. The church says, we're going to baptize your culture, which is going to cleanse all the demonic content, and then we're going to take what was preserved from Adam, because you do have something preserved from Adam. You've got the great spirit. You've got mighty Gitchy Manitou. You've got whatever. And we're going to preserve that, and we're going to baptize all the demons out of your culture, and you're going to preserve, and you're going to become a people of God. You're going to become a cat, the Catholic Indians of, of uh, the Huron Indians or whoever, you know. The, uh, you know, the mestizos from, uh, from Mexico. You keep your culture, but it's cleansed the, demon co- the de- demonic content. So the book of Genesis, oh man, let's see. Time do I have to be done again? <laughs> I forgot. What time do I have to be in that? So uh, we wrap up, wrap up at 9 o'clock. Usually there's some Q&A. Oh yeah, there's like Q&A, right? Oh, it's almost 8 o'clock. Okay. So, Just making sure I don't go too long. I, I, I tend to be long-winded. Okay. <laughs> so this is the, why these genealogies are so important. Because when we understand whose father was who, we understand who was passing down that cultus and who your father was. So the very, the, one of the keys is when you have Noah. You have Noah come out. What does he do immediately after he gets out of the ark? Anybody remember? Then Noah... Yes, he built an altar and called upon the name of the Lord. This is the repetition of the righteous line in Genesis. Then he built an altar and called upon the name of the Lord. Notice what's happening there. Cultus, tradition, oral culture, they're, they're worshiping the logos. They're worshiping the logos according to the right of Adam as it existed. I'm going to quote from, this is from a fundamental text called On Divine Tradition. This is from, John Baptist Cardinal Franzelin, he was a peritus at the First Vatican Council. And this is a, one of the authoritative texts that any theologian worth their salt should be quoting if they talk about tradition, because he's kind of the expert of the modern period. What is a peritus? A peritus is a theological expert at an ecumenical council. So like Joseph Ratzinger, 
was a peritus at the Second Vatican Council. So he was a priest who was a theologian professor whom Cardinal Frings was the bishop. He brought Joseph Ratzinger with him to the Vatican Council. He said, hey, you're really smart. I want you to help me at the council. So he brought him over. So this is an example of a really smart guy that they liked at the First Vatican Council. Okay. Um, all right, page 354, he says this. From the origin of the human race, even to Moses, revelation was at first given by God, the creator and sanctifier concerning divine worship and divine law. Even more, revelations were preserved from the, about the future life, about angels, both good and bad, and especially on the one who was going to come to renew the human race, even without any scripture. Primitive revelation was preserved, however, in part by an ordinary ministry through the succession of patriarchs and partly by an extraordinary ministry through the charism of the spirit of prophecy by which it had been advanced, advised both for the conservation and the explication as well as accomplishing always by the increment of revelation. Okay, that's a little wordy, but the point is, the point is that God founds an oral culture. He creates this oral culture. That's what he does in the very beginning of Genesis. The whole book of Genesis is an oral tradition written down. Here's where we come to our definition. Scripture, scripture is a written form of oral tradition. So the whole book of Genesis, tradition, traditionally, the whole Torah is written by Moses. And it, you, he, there's parts in the Torah where it says, then Moses wrote all this stuff down. So traditionally, we ascribe the authorship of Genesis to Moses. So if that's true, then all of the stories of Genesis, all of the stories of Adam and Noah and Abraham and everything was all passed down orally. They told the story of all these patriarchs. And this is why the genealogy is important, because you're passing down. These, this is the righteous line who passed down all these, these uh, stories and everything. And then they finally wrote it down in Genesis. So the book of Genesis itself is the written form of this oral tradition that's been passed down. But there's more to the, oral tra- there's more to the whole tradition and the explanation than just what is written down. Because there's a whole explanation about what all that means. If you don't have the explanation, you're going to take the whole Bible out of context. And that's, this is what I'm saying, is that the whole context of the Bible is this oral tradition. So if you don't have the oral tradition, you're going to take the entire Bible out of context. So, so the, I was going to say the, the genealogies real quick. So we have um, Shem, Japheth, and Ham. He's the bad guy. These are the three sons of Noah, okay? So the scripture talks about Shem and Japheth, So there's this curious story about Noah, you know, how he planted a vineyard and got drunk. Then he was naked. They saw him, or Cam saw him, actually. So there's various interpretations and speculations as to what exactly happened. We're not sure exactly. But we know that Ham was the one who sinned. Somehow, whether there's different speculations, we're not going to get into that. But Ham somehow sinned, whereas Shem and Japheth did not. And so in response, Noah curses, not Ham, but Canaan. Some speculation is something that Ham did actually resulted in Canaan, and it was sinful. Put that together. But the, the generations are cursed. Well, why are the generations cursed? Is because this, this process has been corrupted now by this sin. And this is because... When you have a bad father or a bad mother, they, they, they uh, pass something wrong down to you. They're either a bad example or they hurt you or they do something or they, they, don't, they don't teach you properly. They teach you the wrong thing or whatever. All sorts of things can happen in that transmission, and it ends up corrupting that transmission on down the line. And so that's why we have the origin of the Canaanites. The, the, the big enemy in the Torah is the Canaanites. Is this genealogy from Ham? Because this whole thing got messed up because this, became a, this could became a wicked line that rejected piety because the main story, the main point about Noah is that Ham rejected piety whereas the other two sons didn't. 
They had piety. They, they respected their father. They covered up his nakedness. They covered up his, his pro, whatever his problem was, whatever was going on. They covered up his nakedness, which is an act of piety. St. Gregory the Great interprets this as when you see your, your father doing something wrong, we should try to make excuses for him, cover his nakedness. It's like when, if, if we don't like Pope Francis, we need to love him anyways and try to make excuses for him. That's what we should do for our father. <laughs> That's how we act towards our father. We don't disrespect our father. We don't go around spreading uh, impiety towards our father. Now, uh, no, uh, that goes for your priest, your earthly father, your mother. We don't disrespect the whole structure of this culture, or else we're going to have a we're going to have a revolt on our hands, which we'll get to. <sighs> so, uh, where am I? So, basically, okay. So the written form comes in with Moses. Moses, who starts writing things down, he writes down the Torah. Now, the written form of oral culture comes in as the Torah, especially as a covenant between God and man, and, because, and between man and, and each other, and man back to God. So the written form, this is what also is in, is in the Torah, is when they make a monument, if you remember that from the Torah, where people make a monument. They raise a monument to help remember something. Like, I made a, I made a covenant with you to keep your sheep on this side of that, and I'll have my sheep over here. I'm going to raise this stone right here as a witness between you and me so that we will keep this agreement. And this is what one of the aspects of Scripture comes in, is that this is a written form of something that's going to keep our agreement so that it's a witness against me. I'm making an agreement. That's why we, you know, we have wedding rings. It's a witness that I have made a, I've made a covenant. I've made a vow. So... This comes in as the covenant comes in with Moses. But this is all, the whole context here is the oral culture. Because Moses, like for example, the book of Deuteronomy is literally a speech. If you read Deuteronomy, it's actually just a speech that Moses is giving. And it happens to be written down. It's the written form of oral tradition. Now, this brings in the concept of oral Torah. You ever heard of oral Torah? If you talk to an Orthodox Jew, he might talk about oral Torah. Oral Torah is Moses' explanation for the Torah, which he gave orally to Aaron and the priesthood. And the priesthood's job, they're the elders. Their job is to guard the tradition. And that included the oral Torah of Moses. Why do we know there's an oral Torah? Well, if you crack open your Bible to Nehemiah, a.k.a. 2nd Esdras, depending on which Bible you have. Chapter 8. Chapter 8 is when the... So the Israelites have gone off into exile in Babylon, if you remember the story. Then they come back and they rebuild the temple. And then the priesthood establishes the sacrifice again. And then they, they dust off the, the law of Moses. They dust it off and then they read it all to the people. And here's what the scripture says. And Nehemiah... And Esdras, the priests and scribe, and the Levites, interpreted to all the people and said, This is a holy day of the Lord, our God, do not mourn or weep. They read in the book of the law of God distinctly and plainly to be understood, and they understood when it was read. But there's a note. On the second day, the chiefs and the families of all the people, the priests and the Levites, were gathered together to Esdras, the scribe, that he should interpret to them the words of the law. So he needs to add an oral explanation to reading the, the law of Moses. He's got to read through the whole law of Moses, but there's also an oral explanation for all the extras. And these, are little, these can be little things like what kind of exactly this, that little minutia in the lamb or the sacrifice of the Pasch or various little things that just get passed down by custom or different explanations and different understandings. And all of this we already see in Genesis because Genesis already has that oral tradition. And then Moses brings in this written scripture. And so there's already this long oral tradition. So the scripture itself talks about the oral tradition in the very context of the Holy Scriptures. So this is an example. So scripture witnesses to its own context in, in this and other verses, which I'll bring up in just a minute. So what happens when our Lord, when the Logos is incarnate, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
Well, our Lord comes and he establishes his own oral tradition, not according to a corrupted form of the oral tradition. Now, because when we got to our Lord, there's all these wicked lines of Jews. So there's now the Pharisees. So there's Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, Zealots, etc., etc. They got you got the the Philo Philomites in Alexandria. They're mixing with Greek philosophy. The Jews are they've got all sorts of different interpretations about what the law of Moses means. So it's a crisis of oral Torah that's happening in the first century when our Lord comes to town. It's a crisis of oral Torah because Esdras the scribe may have explained it then, but since then all the Jews have divided. And why? Because there's no prophet. There's no prophet is calling the people back and speaking for God. There's been this dearth of prophets, this, this silence of prophets. So the Jews are in a crisis. They're going all over the place. But our Lord comes in and he says, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And what he does is he does not entirely, completely reject the oral Torah. He actually, it's really funny, he does not completely reject the Pharisees, in fact, uh, which is interesting because if, if, you, if you talk to an Orthodox Jew and he's got the Talmud and he compares the doctrine of Jesus Christ with the doctrine of the Talmud, there's actually an overlap. There's an overlap with the Pharisaic doctrine and there's the, so the extreme Pharisees who are totally out of whack, and that's whom our Lord is actually speaking to. What's up? Good question. The Talmud is actually the oral tradition. That's the oral Torah written down. Oh, okay. Yes, that's the oral Torah of the Pharisees written down. That was written down um, between 400 and 600. Thank you for it. If anybody has a clarifying question like that, please. Yeah, what's up? Good question. The Septuagint is a Greek, in, a Greek translation of the Old Testament that was in like 200 BC. Okay, 200 BC, we got the Septuagint. LXX, that's the abbreviation for 70. Septuagint, the Greek word means 70. So the Septuagint is a, is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. That goes into the other fact that there's also multiple versions of the Old Testament at this time. There's at least four different types of uh, four different traditions of the Old Testament itself at this time. So not only are the Jews all divided in all these different things about their oral tradition, they also have four different scriptures too. So it's a little complicated. <laughs> so you got the Septuagint. You also have the, uh, you also have the what we might call the Proto-Masoretic, because you've maybe you've heard of the Masoretic Hebrew. That's a Hebrew tr uh, tradition of the Old Testament. It's not a translation. But it is a tradition. Uh, so the Septuagint's older because it's 200 BC. So it's from an ancient Hebrew manuscript. It's now lost. We don't have it anymore. The Masoretic is newer. That's dating from 800 AD to 1000 AD approximately. But that was actually transmitted by um, non-Christian Jews. And it's, a di it's very, very different at times than the Septuagint. And that goes into a whole other discussion which we can do. But there's also the, there's two other forms of the Old Testament at this time, at least two others. There's the Samaritan Pentateuch, and then there's also the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is a fourth thing that's also kind of different and way more complex than we could get into as well. So there's all these different forms, all these different things. And what does our Lord do? Our Lord, because here, here's, the, here's the key, key part about the, the scripture context. The scripture contact is this oral tradition. So what, what virtue must we have absolutely to understand the scripture? We have to have piety. We have to understand this oral tradition passed down. Because as I said, Ezra's the scribe, Ezra's the priest. He explained the Torah to the people. They had to have piety at that time to understand what they were reading. If they didn't have piety, they'd be like Cain and they'd make their own thing. And that's what we have when our Lord comes to town, is that all these different Jews are making their own thing. They're not keeping with piety to the tradition. And this is why our Lord says things like, you have, you have used your own tradition to undermine the commandments of God. 
because they don't have piety to receive this tradition. So our Lord comes and he restores the proper understanding. First, first thing he does is he restores the proper understanding of the, of the Torah, of the law of Moses that had been lost or obscured or mixed with a bunch of errors. And then he builds on top of that and fulfills the Torah by going deeper and adding to it as, um, what well, was the scripture this past Sunday? What was it? It was, um, it was the divorce. Mm-hmm. So it was like Moses actually let you divorce, but it was because your hearts were hard. Yeah. So he actually restores it back to what it was in the beginning. So he's actually heightening it, and he's also creating a sacrament out of it. So he's not only restoring it back to the Genesis, he's also creating a sacrament out of it too. So he's, he's elevating everything to the deeper level. And what our Lord comes, what he shows us, is that not only do you need piety. So, so here's, here's an example of our Lord restoring the oral Torah, the proper oral Torah. St. Luke, my, one of my favorite passages, is the road to Emmaus. And you know the story. They're, they're going to Emmaus. Their hearts are burning within them. And then he said to them, uh, this is what we had hoped he would be the Messiah. And Jesus says, O oh, foolish and slow of heart to believe in all things which the prophets have spoken. So it, it, he's rebuking them for already their lack of piety in receiving the true tradition, understanding and having faith. And he says, ought not Christ to have suffered in these things and so to enter into his glory? And then here comes the oral tradition. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things that were concerning himself. That would have been great if he wrote that down, right? But he didn't. Because it. How, how many hours does it take to walk from where... <laughs> Like, what is that, six hours or whatever? So he, he gave them a six-hour discourse. Um, but, and then there's another, there's another example of it. Let me, and this one's even cr- better than that. Acts of the Apostles, chapter one, verse three. He showed himself alive to the apostles after his passion by many proofs for 40 days appearing to them and speaking of the kingdom of God. 40-day discourse now. It's all oral. When our Lord came to town, he did not write a book because he is the Logos. He is the Logos, and he communicated his doctrine about himself, as we read from Dei Verbum. It's a a revelation of himself, and you're revealing yourself. And when you you reveal, it's like like getting married. You reveal yourself to your spouse. You don't say, I'm going to write you a book. And give it to you. That'll be our, you know, wedding exchange of, no, you, you, you talk to the person. You have an oral exchange talking to each other. You, you reveal yourself through communicating. And that's this communication, this oral tradition. Now, obviously, you write love notes. Well, the Bible is a love note from God. Somebody said that when we were, I stole that from you. Whoever said that in your, in your intro. Somebody said something similar to that. So it's a love note from God. So... But, but Jesus Christ reveals himself orally. He speaks. And we have these references where he's speaking for 40 days. Wow. And this is after the resurrection. You know, the disciples didn't know what was going on most of the time. And finally, we have over the resurrection, he, he finally opens up the scriptures and explains everything for 40 days. But they didn't write it down. Why not? Why didn't they write it down? Because it's an oral culture. They all remembered it. They all remembered it because it's an oral, tr- it's our oral culture because everybody remembers stuff in oral cultures. But even better, check this out. St. <laughs> Luke 24, verse 45. Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So it's not, we don't just need piety. We also need the Lord to open our understanding. It's not merely that my father teaches me the doctrine and I receive it and I have piety, but there needs to be an actually an action of the Holy Spirit on my understanding so that I understand the scriptures. Oh, this one actually was 
Uh, this one's on for, verse 45. It's in another appearance, actually. But that, that's another, that's, we could go on about that, about the, the cultists and everything too. But uh, we don't have time to get into that. But there's, here's another crucial piece. Now, all my Protestant convert friends are, are adding up how all this adds up to refuting Protestantism. And we'll get to that in just a minute because it, it completely refutes Protestantism. And this is, this is the, the slam dunk verse for the Protestants. Ready? Uh, St. John 16, 16, verse 12. Here it is. Okay. St. John, Gospel of St. John, chapter 16, verse 12. I have yet many things to say to you. This is Jesus. I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will teach you all truth. Let's think about that for a second. So Jesus Christ not only does not write, write a book, he says everything orally. He explains so many more things that are written than what are written in the Gospels. He explains, it. He explains things like the priesthood. That's why it's not, it's not entirely clear exactly. And there's not an expedition of ordination, an explanation of ordination. We just have these little hints and verses. He explained all that. He explained things, but there was a lot of stuff he didn't explain. And he says right here. So this is why the scripture, the scripture witnesses to its own context. So if the Protestants really want to follow the Bible, they can follow the Bible right here into the real context of the Bible, which is the oral tradition, and the fact that the Holy Spirit is going to guide them into all truth, even more than what Jesus Christ himself even talked about. So, this is the whole context of the Holy Scriptures, is this oral tradition, which is then given to the apostles. He orally speaks all of his doctrine to the apostles. Then the apostles go out, and they are empowered by the Holy Spirit to know all truth, and they are guided into all truth to form the whole deposit of faith. You ever heard that term before, the deposit of faith? The deposit of faith, that is our Catholic faith. That is the revelation of the Catholic faith. So that's revelation, okay? After the death of the last apostle, there's no more revelation, okay? Revelation is the revealing of God's whole person. That's the deposit of faith. The deposit of faith is then given to, and I, I, I should look up that one. I forgot the one, the one more slam dunk verse. This is for your overtime <laughs> when, when uh, the Protestant is, is really not. Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Remember the word of the Lord Jesus. Hmm, I'll find. Uh, okay, here we go. So what happens next to the apostles? Most of the apostles don't write books. They didn't write books, most of them. Why didn't they write books? Because we're in an oral tra- we're in an oral culture. People remember stuff. But just in case they don't remember stuff, they got one guy who's the best guy that they converted, and they entrusted everything to him. And he's the bishop. 1 Timothy 2.2. 2. Here's the other slam dunk. And the thing, so this is St. Paul, the apostle, speaking to his bishop, St. Timothy. He's the bishop of Ephesus. Okay, so he's, he consecrated the bishop. Now he's instructing the bishop about what to do. St. Paul says this, And the things which thou hast heard of me by many witnesses... Wait, did he write something? No. He heard it from many witnesses. This is an oral culture. Remember the things which you heard of me by many witnesses, the, the same commend to faithful men who shall be fit to teach others also. And this is making reference to apostolic succession. So the bishop in an oral tradition, he's, this, is like, this is like Homer. Homer was an epic bard or other poets like this. Their job was to memorize everything and recite a really long poem for six hours. Actually, this recitation of Homer takes like 24 hours straight. Because <laughs> we, we did it in college. There was a, we call it the Homerathon. <laughs> it's a long time. It takes a while. But uh, what about the unwritten ones? The unwritten ones? Yeah. Oh, boy. Well, uh, that takes a little bit longer. In, in Greek or, or in no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but to Michael's point, there's actually a musical rhythm to the Greek text of Homer. There's it, it a musical rhythm. Let me recite it for you just a minute. It's, um, 
That's the, there's a rhythm in Homer. Odyssey, actually, but yeah. We had, to, we had to memorize that in Greek and then recite it in college, so. Um, but this is why, but um, this, is, this is the oral tradition. This is how the apostles founded the church. That Jesus Christ founded the church Without a scripture, all they had was the old. They had the Old Testament and the oral doctrine, the deposit of faith, the rule of faith. This is why we say the Apostles' Creed. That's an, the Apostles' Creed is an oral tradition written down. That's what the Apostles' Creed is. Here's another slam dunk. Second Thessalonians two fourteen, Saint Paul says this: Brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have learned, whether by word or our epistle. So this is an example of Protestant translations will actually mess with the words and they'll take the word paradosis, which is Greek for tradition, and they'll change it to teachings because they don't like traditions because Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ condemns the traditions of the Pharisees. It says you you know, traditions of man. But there's other verses where the Bible actually tells us to, to keep to the traditions. So the NIV, the New, New, the New International Version, which is the Protestant version, is like the most famous version that they use, actually mistranslates things like this and takes, takes tradition, same word, both pl- passages, takes one as teachings and the other ones as tradition. It's an example of that. But it says, hold to the traditions which you have learned, whether by word or epistle. It doesn't matter if I said it publicly to you orally or if I wrote it to you. It's a tradition from me, the apostle, and it has authority. So this is the context of the Holy Bible. And you guys want to do small groups? It's 8.20. Uh, you're doing fine. So. Yeah? Okay. So you just keep going as you like. And then we can even do Q&A with small groups at the end or however you would like to conduct it. Anybody have any thoughts or questions before I talk about I the Protestants? A million. <laughs> a million. Sweet. <laughs> Sorry. I was just like waiting. Like, Go for it. First of all, okay, my first question. Um, and I'll contain myself to one for now. But I'm curious to hear like your hot take per se. Um, about like what Bible translation do you think we should be reading as Catholics? What ones are good? Which ones we should stay with at all costs? And then maybe also talk about like commentary that we can find in Scripture. Of course. So, yes. Of course. Yes. Well, there's um, there's a uh, chapter ten in my book is a linguistic analysis of English Bible translations. He's the right guy to ask. <laughs> and uh, it goes into a bunch of technical stuff about languages and whatnot. But for me, I can't stand scriptures that denigrate Our Lady. I can't stand it. I can't tolerate it. I'm going to throw you out. Because if you don't translate Luke 128 as full of grace, you're out throw you out. <laughs> I can't stand it. Or, which is almost worse to me, uh, I can't stand Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, a young woman will conceive and bear a son. Wow, do you really think it's a sign from God if a young woman conceives? Wow, how miraculous is that? Young women are conserving all the place. What's, it doesn't make any sense. It's terrible. So, so we talk about why, why these things happen, and it has to do with all these technical stuff, which we can get into if you want to, about the Hebrew and the Septuagint and all this other stuff. But suffice it to say, the basic is, it goes back to the oral tradition. You have to, when you translate the Bible, you have to respect the oral tradition. And this is why it's so important. The Holy See, to this day, says you should use the, the Vulgate to translate the Bible. Now, now there's some, such a thing as the new Vulgate. The Nova Vulgata, which is another story. Just in case anybody, the Vulgate is... Thank you. (laughs) So the Vulgate is a translation by St. Jerome. We just had his feast day, September 30. St. Jerome, the greatest biblical scholar ever, perhaps. That's debatable, I guess. But (laughs) he he translated the Latin Vulgate. Pope Damasus in the 400s said... Hey, we need you to go translate the Bible. So he took all of the Greek manuscripts and all the Latin manuscripts and all the Hebrew manuscripts that had, and he learned Hebrew and he, to his knowledge, wrote the best edition of, of the Latin in the 400s that he could muster. Now, it's a complicated story, but 
eventually there's like there's other discoveries like the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. We we discover more things, we discover more manuscripts. So the church is always approximating the best we can. We don't actually have the original text of the Bible. Why do you think that is? Because the real context of the Bible is the oral tradition. It's not the actual scripture itself. It's a pr- Every scripture is an approximation of that original text, which we don't have. So it's a copy of 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 a copy. And eventually you got little changes and little... And there's also these various, like I said, there's, there's the Septuagint tradition, there's the Metazoric Hebrew tradition, there's the Dead Sea Scrolls, and some of them totally disagree on what the verse says. They're completely different readings. There's like no way they could, they're just a totally different thing. Um, so the reason that we should use the Vulgate is because every translation is a, an interpretation. Every translation is an interpretation because one word in one language has three different meanings in the other language. And so if you choose one word, you are isolating the meaning. Like the word logos is the best example. The word logos in Greek is a very deep word. It has tons of meanings. It means word. It means reason. It means order. It means rationality. It means argument. It means all sorts of things. That's why we have, in English, we have biology, philosophy. That's not, that's actually, biology, what else? Uh, Everything that ends in ology is from logos. It's like the order of that thing, okay? But in, in, in Latin, it's verbum. Now, that's isolating one aspect of logos and isolating it to verbum. Now, it's saying, so that's interpreting the most important part about logos is the fact that it's a word. So that's an interpretation. But the Latin is giving us the proper interpretation of logos, or more properly speaking, it's the most important interpretation of logos. So... The Latin Vulgate, why the Latin is so important is that you have, to, uh, you have to translate our English over here. We have to translate the English in the tradition of the Latin. We can't go straight to Logos because we might misunderstand what's so important about Logos. What is so important about Logos? Is it, is it, is it uh, in the beginning was the argument? Is that what you mean by Logos? No, no, no. We mean verbum. That's the most important part about logos. And so that's why when you, Luther comes along and he's like, oh, no, I'm going to go straight to the Greek. I'm going to go straight back to the Latin. But what he does actually is he imposes, he imposes his Renaissance humanism ideas about what that means. He skips over the Latin, goes straight to the Greek, and then he imposes his ideas on the scripture. And that's where we get some nonsense like in the... Like, <laughs> Uh, behold, a young woman will conceive and bear a son. No, no, that's not what's so important about the Hebrew word Alma. It's not so important that Alma is a young woman. Get out of here. This is what, this is what, uh, this is what's so important about, uh, I got to read this Greek word because it's so fun. <sighs> Let's see. Uh, Luke. What's, what's the, uh, so this is what, to your question, I'm this, sorry I'm so long-witted. I'm loving this. Okay, great. <laughs> Chapter 1, verse, tw- uh, Luke one twenty eight. So if you ever want to test a Bible translation, just go to one twenty eight, Luke one twenty eight, And uh, here's what, uh, here's what the angel, there, uh, there's a great article on 1 Peter 5 tomorrow. I'm really excited about it. You should go read it. It's about, how the rosary is analogous to the announcement of the trumpet against the Lord's enemies. But So the announcement of the rosary, the Ave Maria, the angel, angelic salutation says, Kyrie kekari tomeni. Kekari tomeni. What is the most important thing about that? Well, the Protestants think it means highly favored. That's a joke, because <laughs> this is a perfect form of the Greek words. It means someone who has been perfected in grace, perfected, totally perfected. Perfect, perfect is a tense that only exists in Greek. It's like, well, I guess we have perfect tense, but it's not the same in Latin. Perfect tense is like everything has been perfected about this thing, and now it exists now. It's what perfect, perfect tense means. So 
the Latin says, well, it means gratia plena. That's the most important thing about what this means in Greek. Now, does it mean highly favored? Sure. Okay, yeah. I mean, you could make it say highly favored, but that's not the most important understanding of what this Greek means. The most important understanding of it is that she's full of grace. And so Protestants will come along, well, I'm going to go straight to the Greek. I'm going to go to the original language and skip that Latin medieval crap. Well, you misunderstood because this is the early church understanding. This is the key is that the Latin was the, old, the Latin was the other big language back then. It was Greek and Latin. So they translated everything into the Latin. Latin was the other. So Latin gives us what did the early church understand from the Greek. Latin is what gives us that understanding. This is what the early church understood of that, that term. This is the early church understanding. The Protestants think they're becoming early church because they can just, they can go back to the Greek or whatever. But they're imposing their 16th century Renaissance Western Europe understanding on the early church. Because we already got what the early church understood from that word. Anyways, to get to your point, I, bottom line is there's only two translations that I would recommend in my opinion. This is my opinion. I mean, half of this stuff is my opinion, so but I, I don't think anything I've said is against the church or anything like that. But, but this particular thing is my own personal opinion because there are translations that the bishops have, have approved, like the NAB, which is read at, at uh, which has to be read. It's cannot, any other translation is not allowed in the American Catholic Church. You cannot read anything but the NAB. New American Bible. New American Bible. Uh, but in my humble opinion, just my opinion, I do not like that translation because it mixes with a bunch of this nonsense with full of grace or highly favored. Ugh, it's terrible. Isn't so, it, Isn't the NAB trying to be a little more like vernacular? Like it sounds a little more like it reads like we would say it today. That's what I was thinking about. Like it's not as exact as but it's like they tried to make it sound more like the way we would say it. I yeah. Mean, well, there, basically there was a... So basically... There was a translation philosophy in 1969 called Comme le Poivre. It was a French term. And their ideas, this is how, you know, how you translate, we transitioned from the second Roman Missal to the third edition of the Roman Missal, you know. And also if you came, became, and with your spirit, it had the same effect on the Bible. The NAB was translated more at a time when they were translating what's called sense for sense translation. Another term is dynamic equivalence. Dynamic equivalence is you have a sentence and you don't translate it word for word as much as you can. You just say, well, his basic idea is this. So I'm just going to kind of paraphrase what he said in my own words. Okay, that's the basic of what it is. So NAB is following some of that. Um, but basically, I, I, in my humble opinion, and this was actually... Coma Pauvois was actually revoked by John Paul II because they started using these same, these same uh, principles to start pushing all this like feminist understanding of, of like we shouldn't use like we shouldn't use a, a masculine pronoun for God or whatever, things like that. They started pushing that into the translation and they actually finished a translation of the liturgy and they sent it to Rome, but Joseph Ratzinger and John Paul II rejected it. And then they, they had a new thing called Liturgium Authenticum in 2000, which said, no, no, we can't translate sense for sense. We have to translate word for word. And that's how we got, this is the, the Bible I recommend, which is the RSV second edition. Is that the, uh, the commentary from... So Scott Hahn and this is, in my opinion, the best Bible out there. Uh, I am actually partial to the Dewey Reams myself, and I'll explain why, but Scott Hahn and Curtis Mitch. Now, there's also a first edition. Don't get the first edition. Get the second edition. So this is, it, this is RSV, second Catholic edition. This, this one has commentary. The commentary is absolutely phenomenal, especially read the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is awesome. And when you, just, when you really understand the book of Revelation, it's so awesome. Especially if you're a former Protestant, because Protestants go wild with that book, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, but the Dewey Reams is my preference, and the reason is because the Dewey Reams is actually, in my opinion, superior to the RSV in certain places. For example, the term Christ in the Old Testament. 
Why do the nations rage and the heathen take counsel together against the Lord and his Christ? This is the verse that is quoted from Psalm 2 by the apostles when they first start getting persecuted in the book of Acts. Against the Lord and against his Christ. And this is preserved in the Dewey Reams because all, every single place where it says anointed in the Old Testament it actually says Christ. So why should we, why should we use it? In my opinion, I think this is an example of skipping the oral tradition because the oral tradition understood that as Christ. And when you read through that, um, you see Christ all over the Old Testament. And that's in the Dewey Reams, but it's not in the RSV because they prefer anointed. But in my opinion, I think that's, that's misguided, but that's my opinion. So when they say about David being like the Lord's anointed, it should be translated, could be translated the Lord's Christ? Yeah. I, he says, I will not, I will not uh, strike Saul. I will not put my hand on the Lord's Christ. So it, it, it brings a, a ton. And the, now, here's something really awesome, is that in the Hebrew, the term salvation is the holy name of Jesus. You know this? Yeah, I took a Bible as literature class. All right, sweet. Which yeah. I highly recommend Kendall. Yeah. Oh, sweet, okay. Which is very shocking that Kendall was actually offering that. Yeah, yeah there's, this, there's this awesome verse in Habakkuk. Now we're getting real geeky. <laughs> we're, we're pulling out Habakkuk. Here we go. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, I, it's, it's, I don't even remember where Habakkuk is. <laughs> yeah, it's only three chapters. I got I to look it up in the index. I, I got I to gotta really, really uh, humble myself as, as a, an alleged biblical scholar who doesn't know where Habakkuk is. Um, Oh, good. Ten of four. <laughs> so check, check this out. Good one, good one. There you go. So Habakkuk, um, let's see. It's verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 18. All right, I'm going to start at 17. The fig tree shall not blossom. There shall be no spring in the vines. The labor of the olive tree shall fail. The fields shall yield no food. The flock shall be cut off in the fold. There shall be no herd in the stalls. Translation, everything sucks. <laughs> but, but I will rejoice in the Lord and I will joy in God my Jesus. Habakkuk 3.18. That's what the Dewey Reams says. In God my Jesus. And that's making reference to the fact that the Hebrew says, my salvation, with joy, Isaiah, Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11 says, with joy you will draw waters of the, of the wells of Jesus. Jesus is all over the Old Testament, but it's only in the Hebrew. And there's only one place where Jerome decided to translate the Hebrew literally into Jesus. But um, that's some of the reasons why I love the Dewey Reams. Um, it also has sacred language. That's an example. What's up? Challenger, yes. Um, which which ver- version of the Rings do you recommend? And if it's the old one, where do you know where we can find a copy of the old one? Okay, don't read the old one because <laughs> it's too Latinate, which means it, w- it was basically too literal with the Latin so that it's almost incomprehensible in English. Um, so the original, but the, our English language was developed from the King James Bible. Because the Anglican heretics broke away from the church. They had their King James Bible and Shakespeare. And that's how we got the English language as we know it today. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so, so Shakespeare and King James Bible are what we define as beautiful English. But that's only because they had the established English. And that was what was promoted. So if the Dewey Reams would have been at that time, then we would have been like, wow, this is beautiful today. But now we think of it as weird Latinate because our language is developed from the King James Bible and Shakespeare. So Chaloner in the 1700s realized this, and as a good bishop, he realized we need to reword this so it's a lot easier to understand as English speakers. So he reworded it, and the Chaloner revision is what you normally get anywhere you go. This is the one I like because it's a pocket Bible. This one's published by Baronius Press. Questions? Comments? I can go on. Yes. Uh, do you believe in the 
Uh, Joe, what do you want to do? You want to do small groups or do you want to just talk and open? I have a question. Yes. Um, so you asked us the question at the beginning, where do you think scripture and the Bible should be in our daily Oh. <laughs> I want to turn around the question to you. What do you think about that? Let me answer the question as the church has already answered it. It was a trip question. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. No, I'll just play. Okay. Well, yeah, let, let, me, let, me first, let me first give you that. So this, <clears throat> I'm reading this from Denziger. You ever heard of Denziger? In Critian Symbolorum Definitionum et Declarationum. Blah, 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 blah. It, is the, it is the compendium of creeds, definitions, declarations on matters of faith and morals from the Holy Roman Catholic Church. This is like the textbook of doctrine. This is what a seminarian will get in seminary. Okay. So here's, here's what the church has decreed about the Holy Scriptures. <clears throat> Easy access to sacred scripture should be provided for the faithful. All Christian faithful, especially members of religious communities, are admonished to frequent reading. All clergy must engage in diligent reading of the scholarly scripture. The reading of scripture is broadly recommended. It is not, however, useful for all. Consequently, it is not required for all. The reading may only be used pr- approved editions. Now, this, this warrants, we don't have time to go into everything uh, what happened when the, we've touched on it a little bit, but what happened, what I talk about in my book is the rise of these false theologians. Okay. In the early church, a theologian, I've heard some say that if you, if you wanted to become a bishop or he didn't want to become a bishop, if someone was worthy to be a bishop, he had memorized the entire Psalter because he had prayed so much. A theologian was a man of prayer. First and foremost, if you read the life of St. Anthony by St. Athanasius, that's a great text. That was actually the first Christian book bestseller. It's what converted Augustine. They were like, wow, this bestseller, this guy named Anthony went out of the desert. It's crazy. It's awesome. Take a look, take a look Augustine. He's like, whoa, that's awesome. And then he became Augustine, St. Augustine. <laughs> <coughs> but a theologian is a man who prays. That is what a theologian is. Because you can't know the scriptures unless you have piety and then, what, Jesus Christ needs to open your mind to the scriptures. It's not because not, you can't just have a degree or this or memorize the whole Bible. I love the, the, very, first, the very first words of imitation of Christ. Everyone's read that, right? The best book besides the Bible? You haven't read the best book besides the Bible? Seriously. Imitation of Christ. <laughs> They say, they say the imitation of Christ is the most popular book besides the Bible in all of history. Okay. Um, what, here's chapter one, page one, imitation of Christ. What good does it do to speak learnedly about the Trinity if, lacking humility, you displease the Trinity? Indeed, it is not learning that makes a man holy and just, but a virtuous life makes him pleasing to God. What would it profit us to know the whole Bible by heart if we live without grace and the love of God? What happens in the 1300s is that there arises this class of people called the false theologian. This is what I call them, the false theologian. (laughs) Starts with Willem of Ockham. And Luther said, Ockham's my master. And so he's a, the, the Protestant revolt, that's when the theologians arise. And they think, if I'm just a, a smarty pants, I can understand the Bible. That's what they think. That's what Luther says. That's what Calvin says. I'm a smarty pants. I know the Bible. Calvin wrote a huge thing called the Institutes. What was that? I said typical lawyer. <laughs> yeah, Calvin, exactly. <laughs> but they didn't have piety. They did not have piety. They said, all you need is sola scriptura. All you need is a scripture. You don't need the church. I'm a smarty pants. I can teach you the Bible. But that's not sufficient. That is not sufficient. You could know the entire Bible by heart and be go to hell because you are prideful and you reject God. You reject piety and you cannot understand the scripture doctrine without the context of the scripture, which is this oral tradition. So you have the rise of these false theologians. And these false theologians gradually take more and more out of the Protestants Eventually, all the Protestants start becoming atheists in the, in the 19th century. Then you have liberal Protestantism that starts to question things like the resurrection of Christ, 
and all divinity of Christ and all this stuff. And eventually, these, these theologians start to get inside the church, too. They start to get back inside the Catholic Church. And so the Catholic Church is fighting against them. And eventually, today, we have theologians. It's a serious problem in the church today. It's a serious, serious problem. We have, we have a proliferation of lay theologians. Now, there's many great lay theologians. But notice what's different. You're a layman. You cannot pray as much, can you? You can't pray the whole divine office. You can't spend six hours in prayer every day as a religious does. So how can you, how can you get to the level of all the religious who are true theologians, who are men of prayer? You cannot, by definition, if you're a layman, you cannot be a man of prayer as a religious is. That's just a fact. You can't. Now, as I said, many lay theologians do great work. But I would, I would hazard that there are other lay theologians who are not men or women of prayer, and they just think they're smarty pants, and because they've got three PhDs, they think they can just understand the Bible and do whatever they want. And so this is what we have today in the Catholic Church, is we have all these quote-unquote theologians. They call themselves a theologian because they have a degree, but that's not a theologian. A theologian is a man of prayer who knows God, first and foremost. St. Anthony was illiterate. He did not have a degree. So... This is the rise of the, this is what I talk about in the book, is the rise of these theologians, false theologians. So, thoughts, questions? How would you recommend if you get into a discussion with the separated brethren, um, the Protestants, um, how would you recommend kind of approaching this, particularly when there's quite a few texts that, you know, will come at you, or even in a, just an honest discussion with, you know, a good friend, like how would you yeah. recommend bringing all of this, or using this to, you know, help share the love of, the, of Christ and the Catholic Church. Absolutely. Um, yes, well, chapter 13 in my book is refute Protestants in five minutes, hmm. as you know. And in that text, the most important thing about that is charity. Be, the, the most important thing, you, you may be intimidated by a Protestant because he may know the Bible better than you. But if you have charity... You actually know the Bible better than he does, even if you don't know all the texts. Because of piety and knowing God. That's what it means to know the Bible. So this guy, you're talking to a Protestant, he may know every single Bible verse, but if you know God, he who, he who knoweth God, he who loveth not knoweth not God, for God is charity. It's all about knowing God. You can know the Bible. Who cares if you know the Bible? There's, there's atheists who know the Bible. They know the Bible, but they don't really know the Bible because they don't know God. So what you can give to a Protestant, first and foremost, is charity and holiness and virtue and humility. That's what the Bible really is. It's not just a book knowledge. So that's the most important thing. And, and Catholics, because we can also get into this problem where we are... We're so excited about being Catholic. We're like, oh, we're so right about this. And I just want to hammer my Protestant brother, you know, hammer him. <laughs> but that's going to push him away from the church. He's going to be pushed away because he's going he's gonna to realize that he's not really loved as a person. That's what St. John Paul II says in Love and Responsibility. He talks all about using other people. We, don't, we can't use other people. There's the principle of the person. And so even when we're engaging in apologetics, we have to engage as a as, you know, person. So the most important thing is to give them charity. Listen to them. What, what, why are you not Catholic? What do you think? Why do you think the Catholic? I mean, 95% of the stuff they think about Catholics is wrong, like totally misunderstand. You know, we worship Mary and all this nonsense, you know? They all think, <laughs> I mean, honestly, I, I, haven't, I haven't met a single Protestant who understands Catholicism. So, so much of it is just like, uh, actually, it's not that. Here's what it really is. So, like, I mean, you, it's, you could start by just saying, well, what do you think about Catholicism? What are your thoughts? Like, why are you Protestant? Like, just ask them what, what, what's, their, what's their opinion, you know, and just listen to them, you know. And so that, that can sometimes go a really long way. Like, wow, that person just listened to me. He didn't just, like, start an argument. Wow. You know, that, that's a huge thing right there. Um, but refute Protestants in five minutes after you get through that whole sermon about charity – then you get to, okay, now we can get down to the brass tacks and, the, and all the, the proofs. Then we can get to the proofs. But you got to have that foundation of charity first. 
Um, unless you're doing, being a street preacher, then go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Helen Brimstone, go for it. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, but these are, I, I mentioned some of the proofs, some of those texts. Because they, I mean, but they need to understand Catholicism is biblical. That's what they know, need to know. Because they, 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 um, <clears throat> we do believe that the scripture is the written form of oral tradition. It's the supreme form of oral tradition. It's all written down. But, as I said, the, basically the, the thing is that the scripture, here, here's the key point. <clears throat> the key point for the Protestant is, how do you know which Bibles are, which scriptures are, by, or which uh, books are the scripture? That's the key question for the Protestant. Well, how do you know that? Which scripture verse tells you how many books are in the Bible? Right. Which one? There is none. Right. <laughs> so you have to rely on tradition. To give you the Bible itself. And that's how you put the Bible back in context. The whole context of the entire Bible is tradition. Because you wouldn't even have this if it weren't from tradition. And that's so difficult for a Protestant to understand. But all you have to do is say, which verse, show me the verse that tells you the canon of scripture. That's it. Or then you can, then you can go to the slam dunk and say 2 Thessalonians 3.15, whatever that was. And, it, and St. Paul says, stand fast and hold to the traditions, oral or written. And then you can tell the, ask the Protestant, well, how are you following this command from St. Paul? He commands you to follow the oral traditions. How are you following that? If you follow the Bible, you've got to follow the oral traditions. That's what the Bible says. You follow the Bible, follow the Bible. It says follow the oral traditions. So it's just using the Bible to prove the church because it, it, the Bible tef- testifies to its own context. Thoughts, questions? I don't think we have time for small groups tonight, which is such a great 850. So, any other questions? So, um, if you're talking about Protestants, um, how would the way that um, someone who is um, from like the Latin, the Latin right, how does their understanding of Scripture say, you know, you're the most learned Catholic? knows God the best in the modern era, how does that compare to someone who's like a Greek or Russian Orthodox? What's their understanding of, of uh, Scripture? How do, how do they compare? You're asking what is the difference between Catholic understanding of Scripture and Orthodox understanding of Scripture? Basically, yeah. Mm-hmm. Essentially, it's the same. But... The only difference is that we have a living magisterium and they have a dead magisterium. I used to be Eastern Orthodox, actually. I converted from Protestantism. I became a Messianic Jew or something. I got into that. And then I was Eastern Orthodox for a while, and then I became Roman Catholic. Eastern Orthodox have the same beliefs in terms of the scripture and tradition as we do, but the only difference is they don't have a, they have a dead magisterium. They haven't had an ecumenical council since the year 787. Because because they don't have a pope to work out how to, they all disagree with each other about how to create and have an ecumenical council. And there is, the scripture testifies to a living tradition because Acts chapter 15 Acts chapter 15 is when the apostles come together and they decide a question that had arisen after, as we reread, Jesus Christ says, the Holy Spirit will teach you all truth. And so the Holy Spirit has to be active in the church, deciding new questions, responding to new heresies, and all sorts of things that arise. So the Eastern Orthodox disagree about Protestant doctrines. They disagree about what exactly is the nature of this or that thing regarding Protestant questions. Well, we don't disagree on that because we had the Council of Trent, which resolved most of that stuff. So they would disagree about this or that thing. And they would disagree. They disagree about contraception, for example. Well, that's because they have a dead magisterium that cannot resolve that question for them. And their answer, if you go to them, is that they say, well, it's a mystery. (laughs) Well, that's an easy answer. (laughs) But this is, this is exactly, I mean, this is kind of, I'm kind of tug in cheek. There's more to it than that, but we don't have time to go into all the nuances. But um, if you're ever talking to an Eastern Orthodox, um, 
that's, that is the crux. It's kind of the crux as it is as we're talking with the Protestants. It's the crux of, of the question is that, do you think that, uh, like, for, here's, for me, this is one of the keys that made me not Orthodox, is that they cannot agree on who's baptized or not. So if I'm a Protestant and I've had a Trinitarian baptism and I go to Moscow and I want to become Russian Orthodox, they'll say, you're not baptized, we're going to re-baptize you. But if I go to Constantinople and I go to Ecum- Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew and say, I want to become Eastern Orthodox, they say, oh, you're baptized, we're just going to confirm you. So therefore, so this person would become Greek Orthodox according to his... Uh, confirmation, but if he goes to Moscow, he's actually not even baptized. <laughs> so he's not even a Christian in Moscow, but in Constantinople, he's a Christian. And that's within the same so-called Orthodox Church. Mm. Well, in the Council of Nicaea and various councils, we resolved those things. There were authoritative ecumenical decisions by the church that said, this type of heretic is not baptized. So we're going to re-baptize that guy. All the Arians, all the Mormons... The church today does not accept Mormon baptism. So if you're a Mormon, you become Catholic, you're rebaptized because your baptism is not valid. You don't believe in the Trinity. Whereas I was a Lutheran, so we believe in the Trinity, so we had a valid baptism. So the church, I was not rebaptized because I was already baptized. So this is, to, to, I mean, baptism is your membership in the church. So the Orthodox Church can't even figure out who's in the church or not. How can they possibly be the church, the one true church of Jesus Christ, if they can't even figure out among themselves Who's baptized and who's not? To me, that's a big deal. Yeah. So, um, probably the last, last bit, sorry. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's like the orthodox idea of theosis, and I am, it's just, I don't know exactly where that comes from. Uh, and I don't understand, like, what, how that happens, how that, where, like, if that is actually contradictory with the Catholic faith, or if it's just like, just orthodox, I don't know. Yes. Uh, theosis is a Catholic doctrine. Okay. So there's, oh, go ahead. You have a follow Okay, let me explain. Basically, if you go in to the bookstore and pick up an Eastern Orthodox book, basically 95% of everything they say in there is totally Catholic. As soon as they start talking about Roman Catholicism, they misunderstand what they're talking about. In general, I'm just making generalizations here. Not always true in every case. But generally, when the Eastern Orthodox writers talk about anything in the West, they don't understand what they're talking about. So just ignore whatever they say there. Sure. But when they're just talking about the Greek fathers say this, and the Slavonic fathers say this, and all this, they go on and on and on about their Greek fathers, it's all Catholic, basically. Theosis is divinization. It's the process of sanctification, justification. It's the process of partaking of the divine nature. That's what the Roman Catholic Mass, in fact, says uh, at the pouring of the water and the wine. It says, as, as you have uh, humbled himself to share in, his, in our human nature, may we share in his divine nature. And that's what theosis is. It's just a weird term that we're not familiar with because we say deification, that's weird. We're becoming God, what? That's weird. But it is actually a Catholic doctrine. There's a lot of Eastern stuff that's said in a different way with a different philosophy, with a different vocabulary that is difficult for us to understand as Westerners. But most of the stuff, I mean, we have very little beef with the Orthodox, really. There are Orthodox, there are Eastern Orthodox whom I know who are totally Catholic. They've got nothing against Rome. They would just become... Catholic if we all just worked out this dumb schism. They have no problem with Rome at all. They're basically Catholic in, in their hearts. And then there's these other Eastern Orthodox who are on the internet. Don't go on the internet if you want to learn about Eastern Orthodox. <clears throat> the Orthodox on the internet are <clears throat> really angry. If you, yeah, They're really angry and they're really immature. And they don't understand Catholicism and they don't even understand Eastern Orthodoxy. They're just... 21-year-old single guys who are living to just fight against everybody who's not Eastern Orthodox. Sorry, that, that was a mean thing to say. But unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, I think it's true to a great extent. I mean, but whereas when you go to Eastern Orthodox Church and you know people, like I know like my people that I you know, was Eastern Orthodox with, these people are just totally Catholic people. They're not, uh, they're not like against Rome. They're not like prejudiced against all Western stuff. 
um, they're just Catholic and we just need to work out this stupid schism that continues to persist. Did you have any final thoughts or anything you wanted to sum everything up or yeah, um, to leave us with? Sure. Well, if you want to contact me or talk more, talk about orthodoxy, it's a long conversation. Happy to talk more. Um, but uh, you can uh, reach out to me through Joe or I put my email on this uh, this handout, which I didn't give to anybody, but yeah, that was pretty awesome. <laughs> well, I did like, I was told to print out seven copies, which I did for small groups. We never did small groups, but, but if you want to reach out to me, <clears throat> editor at meaningofcatholic.com, reach out to me if you want to talk more or whatever. If I was a real author, I would have had a bunch of copies of my book, but I don't. I only have one, and this is not even the final copy because there's a bunch of errors in it. <clears throat> so, but uh, you can buy my book if you want. <clears throat> so, the most important thing. Where would we buy your book, say? Oh, Amazon. I appreciated that honest slap after you said there's a bunch of errors in it. Like, boom. Like, I appreciated that. Well, yeah, the first edition of my book was a ton of typos that I had to read through it all again and correct a bunch of typos. So. What's the full title? Introduction to the Holy Bible for Traditional Catholics. So, um, so that's about it. But the most important thing that you need to understand the Bible is humility, piety, charity. Mm-hmm. That's the key. Is, that's the context of the Holy Bible I've been trying to say here. Mm-hmm. Is that the Bible is a love note from God to man. It's a prayer that we can pray back to God in the words of the Psalms. So, that is the context of the Bible that we need to use the Bible. As I said, it's not, it's not useful for all, says the church, and that's because there's these prideful people. They should not be reading the Bible. <laughs> that's, that's basically what the church is saying. Hey, these people are really prideful. They're smarty pants. They should not be reading the Bible because the Bible's fire. The Bible is fire, and it'll burn you if you're not careful. If you're not careful, you don't know how to use fire, you're going to get yourself burned, and that's what Luther did, and that's what you know, people do. So you need to use the Bible properly, read it in the church, with the church, understanding the church. And <clears throat> what I'm saying is the Holy Rosary is the Bible. The Holy Rosary is the Bible because the Bible is just the written form of oral tradition. So when you're thinking about the oral tradition, you're doing the Bible. That's what the Rosary is, the Bible. That's how our fathers did the Bible for centuries before it was written down. They had passion plays and all sorts of different things when they did the Bible because they didn't read it. They, they acted it out, all sorts of things. So, so um, I was a terrible speaker because I forgot to pray in the beginning. But I guess I'm glad we prayed before. Uh, that hopefully merited the graces that this t- talk was not a total waste of your time. But let's pray to offer up uh, our souls to God and, and pray that we may use his good gift of the Holy Scripture properly. We pray also for all of our separated brethren that they may know the truth of Christ and become Catholic for eternal life. And we pray for Eastern Orthodox brethren, and we pray for our own souls and the souls of our our families, that we may know and serve the Word of God, who is Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.